We turn in your Bibles, John chapter 3, verses 11 through 21, and as you're turning there, this will be our last Sunday looking at this final section of the conversation between Jesus and, and Nicodemus. We've seen in it a tremendous amount of theology that affects how we live our lives presented in these, in these words. And, and uh, certainly there's more that could be said um, about these passages. And there's certainly more that we could learn. And this, e this morning as we finish up verses particularly 17 through 21, we will be traveling at a little bit of a faster pace. Not because the pa each passage and each thought doesn't deserve individual attention. So my challenge is for you to take what we learned this morning and continue to ponder it in your hearts and in your minds. Beginning in verse 11, I'll read, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. As a Christian, when I read these passages and I, I look at these verses of Scripture, uh, we can see that Christ is exalted in this passage. The glorious majesty of Christ pours through the words preserved for us. We see in these words that Christ was given the most difficult and heartbreaking mission to come to his own and be rejected. He came for the most difficult and heartbreaking mission to be rejected. We see the greatest love story brought forth from this reality that it was in love for his chosen, for his own, that Christ came into the world. We see that, that belief, that is true belief, true saving belief is in Christ Jesus. That the salvation is only found in Him. Now this reality sets Christ apart as unique, as distinct, as the Lord of the world and all that exists. Because He is Lord of all. In the most complete sense possible, he is the only one capable of saving because he is the one who maintains. He is the one who created all things as Lord. It is his perfect, just, and righteous prerogative to carry out his marvelous, immutable plans. They will not be changed. We see Christ is exalted as the light that exposes all evil works and deeds. As the song we just read or sang says, every bitter thought, every evil deed, Christ is the light exposes all. Once again, we see the contrast of tragedy and heartbreak in these passages, and, that, and we see that contrasted with love. The light that would offer freedom out of the darkness is hated. And the darkness that enslaves them is preferred over the freedom offered in the light, Jesus Christ. We see the privilege of working in the light in these passages of Scripture. 
Because it's actually God working within us to his beautiful glory. And all this is summed up in one glorious name, Jesus. Nicodemus, that's who this conversation was with, he did not realize his deep spiritual need for Christ. He saw a need for himself to fix. And it could come as a result of his own works and his own diligence in trying to save himself. He hated the light. And he feared the light, for it would reveal who he truly was. I believe salvation did eventually come to this man, Nicodemus, as the Holy Spirit regenerated this man. But we know something when the Holy Spirit regenerates a person, which results in a new birth, the person will respond in faith. Why does a Christian place their faith in Christ? Why would we do that? Because to believe in Christ is to probe to the <laughs> uncomfortable depths of one's own depravity and to cling to the infinite heights of Christ's glory. Amen. We have to probe those uncomfortable depths of who we truly are before we can ever respond in faith to a perfect, holy God. I think we see this most clearly exampled in Isaiah 6. It says in verse 1, In that year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With the two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Woe is me is to ponder the depths of one's own depravity. Woe, I am ruined. Woe, I am destroyed because I have stood in the presence of Almighty God. John teaches us in John chapter 12 this very reality. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And we have to ask the question, is who did Isaiah see? He saw Yahweh. And who was Yahweh? It was Jesus. And that is who Isaiah saw, is he saw Jesus. He saw the glory of Yahweh. And in that moment, in the light, his works were exposed. And he said, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. When you come to Christ, he will expose who you are. And only then will you see that which is true. Apart from Christ, the greatest light man can prove, provide or make is merely darkness. Man will always think of himself as good. That is until he contrasts himself to a holy God. Until we contrast ourselves to Christ, we will always seem good. We always seem like we've got it figured out. That is until we compare ourselves to Christ. And in which case it will result in saying, woe is me. The beauty of this glorious truth is, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And what Jesus spoke to Nicodemus is what Isaiah experienced. God revealed himself, Isaiah responded, and God stated, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. 
This is how we understand Jesus' words in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And our first point is just simply this. Judgment is not the primary cause of Christ coming into the world. Judgment is not Christ's primary cause of coming into the world. If Christ came to die on the cross, which was why he was sent, as we are told, which was promised by God in Genesis 3.15, that he will come, one will come and crush the head, a death blow to the serpent. Christ came, he did this to guarantee salvation according to his perfect plan for his own. If that's why Christ came, has been stated all through the Old Testament and, and what we see through the life of Christ, then by definition, his mission was not that of judgment. He did not come to judge the world. But we run into a problem when we get to John chapter 9, verse 39. It says, Jesus says, for judgment, I came into this world, that those who do not see me may see, and those who see may become Blind. This actually reinforces what's already being said here. Those that think they see, those that have the righteousness, the, the religious leaders, they will become blind. And those who cannot, the lost that Christ came to save, they will see. Those who do not believe are already condemned. Yeah. Judgment is already present. Christ didn't have to judge that which is already judged. People stand condemned. The world stand condemned already. Christ didn't have to condemn that which is already condemned. John MacArthur writes this, To reject Jesus' peace is to receive his punishment. To reject his grace is to receive his justice. To reject his mercy is to receive his wrath. To reject his love is to receive his anger. To reject his forgiveness is to receive his judgment. This is what we see. Those that are already here are condemned already. They didn't need condemnation. They needed a savior. Jesus came not to judge. Jesus came to save. But he is the judge. We see in Daniel 7 verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is the ultimate judge. Jesus is the ultimate Lord, but he didn't come to judge. He came to save. Christ came into a world that was lost and condemned already. The world already stood condemned and Christ did not need to judge it. It, it was already judged. The, the world did not need condemnation for condemnation was already upon it. What the world needed was a savior. And I think that we see this most clearly illustrated in a story we find in Genesis. In verse eight, in chapter 18, verse 22 we see this interesting conversation between Abraham and God. And we see the idea of condemnation already being present. Starting in verse 22, So when men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham, Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Hang on to that thought for a second. That assumes there's some righteous that are amongst the wicked. And that's key to understanding what God says to Abram. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you, not, will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. 
Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again. But this once, suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. Do you know what the picture of this is? You know why the number keeps shrinking? Because there was none righteous there. They were all under the condemnation of God. They were all under the judgment of God. It, God just simply had to wipe it out and he would have been just. Because everybody there was guilty. Everybody in Sodom. We said, what about Lot? What about Lot? Well, if we follow the story of Lot... We can see that he was not entirely innocent. Have you ever pondered the situation of him and his daughters in the cave together after he became drunk? That seems to indicate not a righteous, perfect man. That seems to represent a sinful man, but yet God, by his sovereign grace, chose Lot and saved him. Sodom was guilty. And every single one of them deserved to be wiped out. And God saved some. The world stands condemned already. Christ didn't come to do that which is already present. He came to save us out of the condemnation. Just as he saved Lot. Verse 16 back in John says that he gave his only son in verse 17 he says for God did not sin the word gave and sin they're synonymous there verse 17 is just further strengthening what is already said that Christ is being sent as a sacrifice if Christ was not coming to speak if he was not sent to judge the world what did he come to do you notice the word but and this is a, a huge, distinct contrast. He did not come to judge the world, but, but he came to save some. He came to save the world. And this is a, a, a clause with a purpose to it, with a sure result. That which he came to do, he will accomplish. Salvation for the world is only through Jesus Christ. And now, this is the opposite view of Nicodemus and the Jewish people that Nicodemus represented. They believed when the Messiah came that he would wipe out all of the Gentile nations and judge all of the Gentile nations. They must have missed reading the book of Joel in which he corrected this philosophy. But we see this as condemnation is not determined by who you are. It is determined by faith or no faith. Christ didn't come to judge the world. He came to save the world. Which brings us to our second point. Judgment for the believer and the unbeliever. Listen, judgment for the believer and for the unbeliever is not some far off distant thing waiting to happen. It is current and it is happening right now. Look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There, there's two whoever's presented here. Those who believe and those who do not believe. And, and I would suggest that we view the world as two classes of people. Those that believe and those who do not believe. And that should be how we always view the world. There's, there's not a third class of people mentioned in this passage of those who, who believed for a time and then stopped believing. It's those that believed and those that do not believe. And that teaches us something very important and integral to our faith. Faith is ongoing. Salvation is eternal. Once we believe, we will always believe, in other words. That does not discount moments of doubt. But it does teach us that belief and faith is ongoing. 
for our entire life. We have a phrase that we like to use, and it's this phrase, uh, once saved, always saved. And let me just suggest to you for a moment that it's really not a good expression to use. And it's not really a good expression to describe our belief of eternal salvation. And I know that we've used that, and I know that I have used that, but it's really not a good expression. Inevitably, when we use the phrase, once saved, always saved, the question comes up, you mean I can get saved and then do anything I want? Because once saved, always saved. That completely misunderstands salvation and sanctification. The Bible clearly teaches that once true faith has begun, the believer will continue on because God granted salvation and God will preserve salvation. We have eternal redemption. We have eternal salvation. Do you believe in eternal security for the believer? Notice the phrase that I used, believer. One that is continuing on as a believer. And that is how we should present the gospel. That once you are saved, you are to continue acting accordingly. It's a present, active word. Meaning belief is ongoing. And it is present in the life of the true believer. Let me just say this. You or I do no one any good when we say, well, they made a profession of faith and then they walked away, never to return, but I know they knew the Lord and I know that they were saved. Can I just suggest that that's the completely wrong approach and wrong attitude? I mean, what makes us think that uh, unbelief equals true saving belief. What makes us think that because a decision was made and someone said a prayer that it's not necessarily even found in scripture and then they never continued on for the rest of their life that we can rest confidently and say, well, they knew the Lord. This is people's souls we're talking about. This is our children we're talking about. This is our grandchildren. This is our cousins and our nephews and our nieces. This is our friends. This is our family. These are our church members that we have to consider. This is their soul and their eternal destiny. We cannot think because something happened here, but then nothing happened as a result of it, that we can just say they're saved and we shouldn't continue evangelizing to them. What makes us think that unbelief equals belief? Because of some prior commitment. Believing means it's ongoing as Jesus states it. But also believing means you're not condemned. Believers cannot be condemned. Because their condemnation has already taken place and it was on the cross. Christ bore it. And the judgment is conducted once. And it will never have to take place again. And that is why I can say we believe in eternal security of the believer. is because the condemnation was on the cross for those that placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Believing in Him is what it is. It's not believing about Him. It's believing in Him. Romans 8, 1. There is no, now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verses 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? His intercession is ongoing. The contrast here couldn't be more striking and more clear between the two classes of people, those that believe and those that do not believe. The second class of person is described with these words, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. This is teaching the same thing as verse 36 that just simply says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Just as eternal life is a present reality, condemnation is a current reality for unbelievers. Martin Luther said it best, he who does not believe already has hell on his neck. Now let me just be clear. 
This doesn't mean that people don't walk away and come back because they have a season of time that happens. But it is to say that scripture is very clear. Faith is ongoing. Those are Jesus' words. We see this as Luther said, he who does not believe already has hell on his neck. Judgment, in other words, has already passed. Belief is continuous, so is unbelief. Those that do, uh, do not believe, that have unbelief, uh, they will continue in it. It's either or. It's not both and. It's refusing to believe, in other words, as those that are under condemnation. And the next phrase uh, looks to the end of the life of the unbeliever and sadly states the reason. And this is the reason that they are under condemnation, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this uh, makes us question where does eternal security then come for? First John chapter 5, verse 13 gives us the answer. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Why? It's to those who believe in the Son of God, in the name of the Son of God. This judgment, by the way, is... Is, is referring to uh, eternal judgment, in, in which that which we go to heaven or we don't go to heaven. Uh, but that does not exclude that there is some sort of uh, judgment that takes place outside of that. And, and that's one thing we have to understand. First Corinthians chapter 3 says, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And the picture is a person going through the fire and they are not burned, but the smoke remains on them. We, we will have to answer for our works. I think that that's clear. We do have uh, condemnation or we do not have condemnation for eternal life. But there is another sense in which there is a clear teaching that we will answer for our actions. Number three, unbelievers hate the light and believers hate their sin. Verse 19 says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Because their works were evil. This is judgment of unbelief. God is just in his judgment of the world. Christ came into the world. He is the light. And the picture is this. Is that apart from Christ. Uh, there is no light in the world. That the only light that is provided for us. Is the true light. The essence of light which is Christ. Other than that the world is helpless without Christ. Darkness defines the world. It is covered in darkness, and no light exists apart from Christ. That is the picture that's being painted for us. And this is why Paul observed, no one, no, not one, does righteous. Believers and unbelievers could not be more contrasted than in this verse. Unbelievers love darkness. They do not love it more than the light, but rather they love it instead of the light. Notice it doesn't say that they love the darkness more than the light. Because that would imply that there is some love for the light. It's they love the darkness rather than the light. Instead of the light. They prefer it and they are happy in the darkness. We see in the light that there is love implied. Not only though do we see that there are affections. Their affections, that they love darkness, are described in this verse, but their actions as well. What are their affections? They love the darkness, but what are their actions? They do evil things. That's what it says. We love the darkness, and then we have our affections there. That's what we love. That's what we desire. And what's the result? They do evil things. How is a Christian to respond in light of this? While Christians are a new creation, they still struggle with the flesh, don't we? We as Christians must make decisions based on things of eternal value. 
We must think of things as ultimate victory in Christ. And that is how we live our life confidently, knowing that we work in the realm of eternity. We can't be like these that are described in John chapter 12, verse 43. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Meaning we make decisions to glorify God because we love God and we hate sin. We make decisions because we know of the eternal consequences. We make decisions because we know that everything else is going to be worthless and fruitless apart from Jesus Christ. We also do this knowing ultimate victory is in Jesus Christ. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Meaning that we have ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. Verse 20 says this, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. Uh, unbelievers uh, do things, they do wicked things and, and that really turns out to be that they hate the light. That's what it means for wicked things. And let me just give you a, a, a list of things here. Number one, doing wicked things is offensive to God. Doing wicked things is offensive to God, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian. God hates sin. The, the, we, we, we seem to think, well, because I have Jesus and I'm forgiven, and that is true, that we can just do anything we want. Doing wicked things is offensive to God, whether we're Christian or not. Number two, wickedness in this verse is really doing anything that is worthless. Uh, that's what it means. Wickedness is the same thing as worthless. And if we contrast worthless to verse 21, in which it says doing something that is true, it means worthless is doing anything that is untrue. Meaning what we do that is sinful is actually worthless. Remember, we as Christians function on the idea of eternity, that Christ has ultimate victory, meaning anything that we do that is not for Christ, not for his glory, is then worthless. Has no eternal value in it. Only eternal value is found in Jesus Christ. Number three, doing things that are wicked is expressed hatred for Christ. When we say we love Christ, but we do things that are wicked, we're actually expressing hatred for him. That's why if you read John 14 and 15, where Jesus says several times in several different ways, if you love me, you'll do what I command. If you love me, you'll do what I say. Why do you call me friends, but then not do what I say? So doing things that are wicked is expressed hatred for Christ. The reason, number four, the reason for hatred of Christ is that he as the light expresses sin. Look at John chapter 7, verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. And as we heard read this morning already, that the world will hate you on account of me. Christ exposes sin and the world hates him as a result. You know, the world has this figured out. They do. The world has this figured out that it's Christ that exposes sin and this is why the world hates him. And this is why when you walk into Starbucks, you will not see a picture of Jesus or Jesus's words, but you'll see a picture of Oprah and you'll see Oprah's words that make you feel good and make you feel good about buying the coffee. And it is good coffee, but what they do not want you to do is feel bad. And if there was a picture of Christ there, if there was the words of Christ there, that would make you question your sin. And the world's got this figured out. And this is why the world just throws Jesus off and paints Jesus in a new light than what the Bible actually paints him. We, as Christians, are supposed to teach this. We are to confront the world. Yes, we are to love the world, but what greater love can we show the world than showing their need for a Savior? How will they know their need for a Savior unless they have climbed to the uncomfortable depths of their own depravity? The world's got it figured out. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They want that which will make you feel good. And that's why you won't find Jesus at Starbucks. But you will find those that make you feel good. Number five, wickedness in this contest is expressed as an ongoing action. Meaning that your wickedness is, is it's a part of your life. It's habitual. It's just the way that your life is lived. Number six, Christians are to be doing something. We are to be doing something. But what we do must be rooted in truth. 
Because it's implied there's something that we do. It's implied that we live our lives, and as we live our lives, we do things. But we can either do things that are worthless, or we can do things that have eternal value, that are rooted in truth, rooted in God's word, verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Believers are to hate their sin. Believers are to hate their sin. And I have to ask you the question, do you hate your sin? Do you hate your sin? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, by, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Do you hate the sin in your life? Believers that do what is true prove who they truly are. We're not saved by what we do, but it is proof of who we are by what we do. John 15 verse 8 says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Believers that, that do what is true, they act faithfully. They act in obedience. And by the way, what is true is a Semitic expression meaning to act faithfully. That, that we are, are acting out of moral behavior because Christ died for us and has transformed us. Believers that do what is true do not think about truth as some sort of mere object or an idea. But we act in the fact that God is absolute, God is faithful, and his truth stands forever. Believers that do what is true come to Christ, the light. Light is more than mere truth or understanding about God. It is truth that leads the believer to moral behavior. Believers that do what is true have their actions rooted in the word of God, as it says, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Believers that do what is true recognize their own inability to do what is true. Augustine wrote this, that to do truth means to acknowledge that we are miserable and destitute of all power of doing good. Meaning what good we do is rooted in God because we're unable to do it apart from him. Believers that do what is true have nothing to hide because their works can be tested by God. Works that are carried out in God mean they are approved by God. Are your works approved by God? Can you say, I work and God would approve it? John Calvin wrote, Hence, let's, let us learn that we must not judge of works in any other way than by bringing them to the light of the gospel. We judge our works, in other words, according to the gospel. And he continued, because our reason is blind. Jesus was speaking to a man. Nicodemus, that was an expert in good works. He was an expert in works. Works that he thought he was doing for God. Jesus shatters that view. Good works are worthless apart from Christ. Good works are worthless apart from Christ. And as a Christian, you are to be doing good works because your faith is ongoing. Because your commitment is not just a one-time thing, but it is a lifestyle of changed, habitually living faithfully to Christ. Where this leaves us should be the same place it left Nicodemus. Asking, do I believe in Christ? Are my works in God? Or are my works in myself? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you from what you have taught us from these verses. Forgive me where I've fallen short, Father, in presenting them. Forgive us, Father, where we do not take heed to them. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to empower us, Father, to live lives changed for your glory, Father. 
we know that we are to be doing good works, but we also know that it's you who's working in us. So I pray that you would work in us now. Before I close, if there is anyone that would like prayer, would like to know about Jesus, would like to know about membership to this church, I'll be here and I'll, I, I would love to talk with you and I'll, I'll wait for you. So just come and please talk if you'd like to know more about Jesus. I would love to share his, his love with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.